Thank you all for joining us today for this webinar during such an unprecedented and difficult time for our industry. We know you still have many challenges to manage related to the COVID-19 pandemic. But even though many businesses have shut their doors to customers or potentially have modified their business to allow for a lower amount of capacity, rodents continue to make themselves at home. With winter approaching, it is time especially to pay attention to them because they are high risk pests during this time as they seek warmer shelter and food. So we hope that today we can give you some helpful information to prepare for the winter rodent threat and reduce a pest risk when you already have so many challenges to manage. And now I'm gonna turn it over to our mediator, Hans Peterson. Hans? Yeah, thank you, Melissa, and welcome everybody. Uh, as Melissa said, my name is Hans Peterson and I'm an assistant marketing manager uh, here at Ecolab and I work in our hospitality and food service segments where we certainly see much of the rodent activity that we manage. So uh, today I'll be kicking off our content, um, talking a little bit about the current circumstances and managing any questions you have. But the real expertise today is gonna come from my colleague, Douglas. Uh, I'm joined today by Douglas Gardner. He brings over 25 years of pest science research and industry expertise. And along with his MS degree in insect science, he's received designation as a board certified entomologist from the Entomological Society of America and as a registered sanitarian from the National Environmental Health Association. So very well qualified uh, to present some good information today and also address those questions. So if you do have questions for Douglas um, or myself, uh, just type those in during the presentation and the Q&A feature there, and we will be getting to those at the end. So we'd love to hear from you. So uh, anytime anything comes up, please feel free to share. So in terms of our agenda today, uh, first, we're just going to quickly put general universal rodent knowledge we're going to share in the context of the current times. Obviously, this is an unusual time and what you observe um, may be impacted by the pandemic and some of the different operational models that we know customers are adapting in response to that. Um, once I've spoken through that, Douglas is going to take you through the biology and the behavior of rodents to tell you what to expect and provide some tips on what you can do to stop or ideally even prevent rodent activity before it occurs. We can share a little best practices and partnering with a pest service provider and how to get the most out of that relationship. We'll share a couple case studies uh, of rodent incidents and how they were managed. And then we're going to open things up to Q&A. So again, please submit those questions if you have them. So in terms of the current context, uh, let's talk about the challenges you're facing right now. Um, we know the pandemic has made your operations much more difficult. You've had to learn on the fly. You've had to do a lot of different things and now you're managing even more than you were before. Uh, that said, our, our big message today is that we also wanna encourage you not to forget about the pest threats to your business. Um, I know it's not top of mind and I know you've got a lot to manage, but pests are a lot easier to control when you remain diligent and they don't go away, unfortunately, just because your guests or your customers have. Uh, additionally, when public health is foremost in customers' minds, we've heard that any issues related to hygiene and public health, which certainly includes rodents, takes on an added importance for your brand. And so untreated issues have a particularly destructive impact on your business in the current environment. And we know that that's not something that anybody can afford uh, at the time. So. Really, the, the critical takeaway is making sure to continue just regular proactive pest service to prevent issues before they become established because the long term cost becomes much worse um, if that's neglected for a period. And in terms of just general reopening advice and resources and um, things that may be able to help you, we do have some available at this link here. Uh, so please consult that if you would like some more information or resources. Now, uh, things have not just impacted humans, obviously, and you may have seen some of this in the media. We've observed um, a secondary impact on some of the pests that closely associate with us, in today's case, rodents. So rats, particularly in large cities, provided a great example of this. So you may have seen some of this on the news. In mid to late March, we saw initial bursts of visible rodent activity in cities. 
as restaurants closed and rodent food supplies became scarce. So less people were out, less people were using restaurants, there was less garbage on the street, you had fewer overflowing dumpsters and street bins, and so this creates a dramatic and immediate loss in food availability and creates kind of a panic uh, for the rodents. So for example, in New Orleans French Quarter, it was reported, uh, they called it a growing rat apocalypse. So the district had these huge swarms of visible rodents on its streets. Um, there were YouTube videos and news reports going viral. Um, there were reports of hunger stressed rats turning on each other as starvation took hold. Uh, there were reports you had these grisly rat battles and rat remains on the street. Um, sorry, that's fairly graphic, but uh, that included Bobby Corgan tweeted about this and reported on that. So he's a world recognized urban, urban rodent expert uh, living in New York City and was reporting on these kind of unusual behaviors. Uh, he also reported on conditions in a large shopping mall that was launched loaded with rats that was completely empty of rat activity as restaurants closed and they vacated the property to search for other conditions. So it was just an, an illustrative case study of how tied city rats are to the human activity. Um, you know, we battled rat populations for years and suddenly victory is obtained by just not having any garbage or activity on the streets. But I don't think that that's the lesson or the solution that we wanna have from it but it does call into attention the, the critical link between sanitation and pest activity. Um, it also sees how responsive rats are to change quickly. So it also tells you that even if rodents have gone away temporarily due to reduced activity, they're gonna return instantly um, and aggressively because they're hungry and they're desperate as we resume uh, businesses and begin providing them once again with the food sources and, and other things that they need. So, uh, with that, I want to turn it over to um, Douglas. We've talked about the unique cir circumstances we're observing, but by and large, the challenges and the threats you're going to move face moving forward is the same that it's always been. And so, to share more about that general rodent threat and how you can combat it, uh, I'll turn to Douglas. Thank you, Hans. So, it's great to be here with all of you today and spend a little bit of time discussing rodents. And let's let's just get right into it. All right, so there's no argument that the presence of rodents in our businesses can have a major impact. Look, I'm all for living peacefully with nature around us, but these animals just don't have boundaries and are associated with very negative feelings in our society. The addition of social media and an ability to immediately document and share our indignations make this pest an unacceptable presence in our business. As you look at this list of negative impacts, which one do you think is the most important? Okay, that's not a fair question. I'm just getting you to read a little closer the list. All right, so these animals can have a major impact and they're not acceptable. Let's turn our attention to rodent behavior and biology and review just a few key characteristics of these pests. All right, there's three common rodent pests that are considered to have a commensal relationship with humans. This includes the house mouse, which by the way is the most successful mammal on the planet besides humans. Also the Norway rat, which is called street rat, sewer rat, or brown rat, and the roof rat, that's also called the ship rat or the black rat. It's interesting that we call these commensal rodents since the definition of commensal is a long-term biological interaction in which members of one species gains benefits while those of the other species neither benefit nor are harmed. Well, and as you can see by the list of pathogens and the fact that we consider these pests, maybe the better symbiotic relationship term might be parasitic. Not parasitic on our bodies, but rather on our communities, our homes and businesses. All right, that's probably getting a little too philosophical here. Fact of the matter is these three species are very closely linked to humans and human activities. And most of us don't want to share our personal spaces with them. But we actually want to have socially social distancing with these guys. All right, let's first look at some general characteristics of rodents. Starting with vision, you may have heard that rodents have poor vision. That may be true when you compare them to humans when the lights are on. They don't see all the colors we do, and they don't have the acuity we do, especially at distances. In other words, things get blurry as, as 
as they move away from from rodents. Okay, however, once the lights get turned off, it's a different story. These animals' eyes are designed for low light situations. High contrast vision focused on the near field, helping them to navigate through familiar spaces in almost complete darkness. Also, look at where those eyes are positioned on the head. With very little movement of the head, they're able to see 360 degrees. Very good placement for a tasty little animal always needing to be on the watch for predators. All right, hearing is excellent. Relatively huge ears, directionally scooping in sound. Taste and smell are also both highly developed. The vibrissi, or whiskers, on their head provide them with a very sensitive sensory field. These specialized hairs are innervated and musculated. They can sweep them around in little circles, or they can push them all forward, and they're sensitive enough with the feel that they can actually feel the texture of the surface they're touching and the shape. It's like a force field around their heads. They also have specialized hairs throughout their fur, providing sensitive touch receptors across their surfaces. Okay, all these senses work together to keep these little animals alive and to be successful in our environments. These are general shared characteristics of the three commensal species. Let's take a little closer look at each. First, we're going to talk about the house mouse. So a few key points here about this animal. Uh, we'll start with droppings. They're relatively small compared to the other two species. They have pointy ends. These animals can rapidly reproduce given plenty of food and good environmental conditions. Okay, so once they're established and rolling, Related females will sometimes create communal nests where all the pups are combined in one big nest and the adult females take turns laying on top of that mass, feeding the babies. You can imagine how that can become a reproductive machine pushing that population growth curve into exponential phase. All right, these animals are not picky eaters. They run around nibbling on food sources, usually not staying in exposed places for long periods of time. They're less cautious around new things than rats, so a little easier to catch on traps. They have a smaller foraging range and will tend to visit foraging areas more often than rats, often multiple times each night. So let's move to rats. There's some important differences to keep in mind. They are larger, stronger, and smarter than mice. They have larger foraging areas. They're more willing to sit and eat their food rather than running around nibbling all night. They need water on a daily basis rather than getting it from their food, from the food they eat like mice do. Rats can sometimes go weeks between visits to a specific foraging area. This means you can be fooled into thinking you have solved a problem and then suddenly they reappear. Rats are considered more cautious around new items in their environment, which makes them more difficult to catch them on traps. Okay, speaking of Norway rats specifically, their droppings are larger, of course, and they have blunt ends. That blunt ends is the easiest way to distinguish Norway rats from the other two commensal rodent species. Adult Norway rats' noses are more blunt than the roof rat, and their tail is shorter, usually less than the length of the body. So if you took the tail and pulled it up over the head, it wouldn't extend past the nose. These pests tend to infest lower parts of buildings, sewers, and they often burrow in soil. Okay, roof rats are smaller than the Norway rats. They have more pointed nose. They have a longer tail, so if you pull it over their head, it'll actually extend past their nose. Roof rats' droppings are usually smaller than Norway rats. I guess that's important if you've got the two side by side, but they also have pointy ends. These rats are excellent climbers. They tend to nest and forage in higher areas in buildings, trees, and other elevated locations. They'll also forage at ground level, like Norway rats do, but this pest is certainly more of a three-dimensional challenge than the other two rodent species. Their geographic presence continues to expand in the U.S., and while they may not be found in as many places as the other two rodents, uh, battling this species has been a real pain point in some locations. In fact, as they move into new areas, there can be years of intense invasion activity in homes and businesses. Much of this is due to us inadvertently providing everything they need to flourish and not being prepared structurally for a pressure from that this pest brings. 
All right, so as we wrap up the behavioral discussion, I, I want to show you a video clip. I'm gonna show you this and we'll transition over to it. It's a video clip that shows a roof rat in a protected area basically learning. So let's look at this. We can see the dark rub marks on many of the surfaces. This is a buildup of body oils and dirt over probably years of activity. See the rat, he's gonna come down that line. Let's watch it as it explores this familiar area. By the way, if these animals have plenty of food and water available, they don't have to spend as much time foraging and they can play this little game in these areas. We can see that apparently it already knows what a snap trap is. It's avoiding those devices. It learns in this exploration about glue traps and gains a better understanding about avoiding them and the limits it can go in working around them. You can see it walk up and then pull back away as those vibrissi touch that glue surface. As this video continues near the end, it's going to go down on the lowest portion down there after it looks around a bit more. And you're, you'll see its tail gets stuck on the glue board that's off to the left over there. I tell you this before it happens so you can see what it does. It's just a temporary catch on that glue board and then watch and see what this rodent does after it's done. So some of these traps are placed right where this rodent's supposed to go. You can see it leaning over, looking. This is complete darkness in here too. And yet it's still sensing this environment, leans over and takes a look at that, that uh, glue board down below, just enough to touch those whiskers on it. All right, here we go. Stops and it thinks about it. So this is an educated rat. It's going through this thing and it's learning this. And as it does this night after night, it, it really figures this out and it knows how to avoid these pieces of equipment. If you think about a whole population of rats with this, um, what happens is you'll have a certain number of them who just get very good with snap traps and glue boards. And if you don't change the way that you approach uh, eliminating them, uh, they'll continue to live and be just fine. So the, the key here is to make sure that, that uh, you use multiple things to get after these. All right, I hope this gives you a little better understanding of these animals, maybe a little respect for what that little brain is capable of doing. Let's apply some of our understanding of this pest biology and behavior and start to explore how to prevent and eliminate these pests from inside our structures. We can divide the rodent world into zones in and around our buildings where these pests show different behaviors. These different rodent behaviors lead to different methods and tools needed to be successful to address them. So we call this the outside in approach because no matter how big the emergency is inside the building, we must remember to keep root causes a top priority. We start on the outside because we know if we can stop issues there, peace of mind prevails. We then will never have the inside emergencies. Okay, so that's the exterior. The building barrier is next. We call this introduction point zone because it's at the rodent introduction points that we actually interact with these pests. Inside, we divide that area into two zones based on rodent behavior. The first is a general zone called interior where these pests forage, feed, cause product damage. And this is where they're often seen. But the other zone, this last one, is called ceiling voids, but it really includes all rodent safe areas where they feel protected. Their behavior is actually different in these areas. They move about freely, often away from walls. You can see that in that roof rat in that previous video. They take time to explore these areas. They learn here. They raise their young here. This is where we cue the soft music and think of happy mouse family moments at their playground. All right, we actually build these playgrounds for them. It's one of the reasons they really like to hang around us. Let's use the backdrop of these rodent behavioral zones to talk about a few things you can do to mitigate rodent activity in your facilities. And then we'll spend a few moments on what you can expect from your pest service provider. So we'll start with the exterior. And here it's all about making sure we're not attracting rodents to areas close to the building and removing perimeter harborage opportunity. This means cleaning up garbage and storing it properly tie off garbage bags, keep lids closed, and make exterior maintenance part of your daily cleaning plan. 
We need to be attentive to water around the structure. Pooling water for extended periods of time invites many pests. Drip lines that form a permanent puddle can result in a commensal celebration of life at your very doorstep. Excessive vegetation, boneyards, stored construction material, or long-term stored items around the perimeter of your building invites pests with safe shelter and harborage. Moving inward to the next zone, Keeping a solid barrier is often an ongoing challenge. It requires proactive attention. Look, an annual inspection along the entire perimeter of the building is a great idea. Let's call it fill the hole February or seal the gap September. How about shut the door December? All right, so door sweeps and door thresholds are usually the most critical things to stay on top of, often the most difficult but making sure your deliveries are free of rodent hitchhikers can, all, hitchhikers can also be important in our discussion of introduction points. They, those should be addressed. Okay, rodent activity on the interior. Look, it's unacceptable. There's really no excuse for ongoing rodent activity inside our buildings. There are situations where elimination can be difficult, but this means we up the game, not give up the game. Reducing clutter, Allowing inspection access and keeping areas clean and organized allows for early detection and rapid re resolution of interior road activity. Finally, hidden areas inside ceilings and walls and other locations can be serious infestation points. Left unobserved, these locations can allow rodents to become established and the population to grow to impressive levels before anyone is aware of the activity. This is so important to keep this in mind. If, if rodents have ever gained access to a building, it's almost guaranteed that they have explored the entire structure and marked these safe zones with urine and feces. Any new introduction introduced rodent, they'll follow these old signs to these safe areas. They'll just dust off the furniture and move right in. Identifying these rodent safe areas, getting access to them and monitoring them can help catch problems long before they become big. All right, so let's talk for a moment about some of the things that you can expect from your service provider. And Hans, what are your thoughts about this? Yeah, thanks, Douglas. That's really good information. I mean, obviously, there's some of these day-to-day -day things that, that you'll have to be responsible for because you don't want a service specialist living in your, <laughs> in your place. But you can't make this your full-time job, so you need to be getting something good from that partnership. Um, really, the pieces to to think about and what they should be providing uh, in that partnership, you want to make sure that there's proper credentials, they should be licensed and certified uh, to perform this work. You want to make sure that they're providing consistent protocols and proactive protocols. Your goal here really needs to be to eliminate the pest. It shouldn't be just the people that you call every time you see a new one in your kitchen. Your goal is to have them not appear in your kitchen, as Douglas alluded to. Uh, so you want that to be their their philosophical approach. They should be providing some of those relevant inspections and they should be doing so regularly. They should be giving you recommendations on what are the things you can do in between their visits. Um, some of the information that Douglas just gave you, that's something they should be able to give you specific to your location and your business um, to how you can can reduce activity even when they're not on site. And making sure that they take an outside end approach. Um, you want to make sure that they're they're doing their due diligence outside the facility, or you're making that inside facility job much harder than it has to be. Um, that's not the only battle that you're facing, as Douglas clarified. So you put all that together, your goal really is is that complete elimination, and that's the approach we'd recommend they take. Now, um, there's a couple tools um, that they should be able to provide to you. Um, there's uh, there's the inspection piece that we that we talked about. They should have some expertise on sanitation and structure and be able to tell you in your particular location what are the the risk areas, what are the concerns, what are some things that you can potentially address on a regular basis. Um, making sure that the focus is on exclusion, not on just trapping whatever's in your building, but making sure that over time those things stop getting in there. And they'll provide bait and products. Um, some of this is responsive things like baits and trapping systems, but it can also include pieces like door sweeps and other tools that are going to help you with that exclusion piece, which makes your job a lot easier. And there's really two types of control um, that they and they probably will leverage a combination of both um, the mechanical control, 
where you're trying to capture rodents before or even after they get inside, or the chemical control where you're using rodenticide application outside the facility. Um, so there's a, there's a few partnership discussions that you want to have. Um, you want to be thinking about when is it appropriate to focus on increasing defenses around and inside the buildings, when and where, because there's regulations on this, should rodenticide be used. Um, sometimes a controlled use on the interior is the best choice, but when is that and how is it going to be controlled? These are all questions that a professional rodent expert backed by solid structure of industry experts and standard science based solutions is going to be able to provide. And that's really what you should be looking for in that partnership, because it's not your job to provide that piece. Okay, well, thank you, Hans. Well said. All right, let's turn our attention to 3 case studies. So, while we review these, please think of questions you might have for us. And you can put that into the Q and a portion. Um, on the screen there. And we'll be happy to answer those with the time remaining at the end. For each of these case studies, I'm going to describe the situation and then focus on a few key considerations in addressing the issue. I won't have time to go through all the details, but hopefully you'll be able to see the general approach that should be taken. Okay, we're going to start with a grocery store. Here's the situation. At least one customer has seen a mouse on the sales on the floor. The health department may have been notified. Store management has rightfully called this an emergency. It's an intense situation as they wait for the other shoe to drop. The sense of urgency in this situation is real. All right, you do an inspection in the store and it reveals mice are well established in two locations in the receiving area. Droppings and product damage are found on the dog food aisle and the bread aisle. And they're also found uh, under two registers. So I think we can probably appreciate the severity of this situation potential closure potential severe brand damage possible involvement of media and even more likely social media so let's let's work together on this here are some key considerations first and foremost is addressing the urgency of the situation all long-term measures are set aside as the need for immediate corrective action takes precedence you've got to eliminate the rodents from the aisles and the registers discard damaged products, clean up droppings. Look, this may require a shutdown and dismantling of gondolas, shelving, and equipment. Intense? Yes, but at this point, there may be no other choice. And this is where you work closely with your pest service provider to determine if that's what's necessary here. Okay, so just looking at the picture on there, the, the picture on the left is actually gondolas broken down with the center pegboards lifted up. And I know there's a lot of different structures to these things, but very often there is this void area in between the backings of the two sides of the shelf where rodents can move into and live in there. So the only way to get in there and get this taken care of in most situations is to actually tear this all the way down like you see here. <clears throat> the On the right-hand side, the top picture shows rub marks on some shelving where hundreds of rodents have run around that uh, vertical support and left dark marks on there. See, it's a dog food area. And then the bottom right, it, it shows outside a bait station sitting there. And what this shows is spilled dog food. And just as we talk through this thing and talk about root causes, you know, that bait station is not going to work very well if the rodents have to dig through dog food in order to get access to the bait inside there. All right, so inside, like I said, the first thing is to take a look and, and get the uh, situation solved out on that floor. As soon as there's a little breathing room there, you have to turn your attention towards that back room and make sure the activity has been addressed. Eliminate the rodents, discard damaged product, and clean up the droppings. So we're not done then. The root cause still needs to be addressed. Where do these mice originally come from? Pressure outside? Holes in the barrier? Introduction by vendors? Trace the issues back to the origin. Fix the gaps in the program and put a better early warning system in place. What that early warning system looks like will depend upon the root cause. All right, I'm sure. Well, OK, so let me summarize how we can move through this type of a situation. Here's the order. First, you address the urgent situation first. Eliminate the mice from the sales floor. Second, go through that whole structure 
and eliminate all rodents. I'm really talking about the back room areas, the warehouse. I don't know why this is overlooked so often. We get so caught up on that emergency situation that we don't get on that like we should. So at the same time you're doing that, the building should be sealed. Determine the root causes and fix them, and then put an early warning system in place. Remember, once rodents have gotten into a building, they establish safe zones, they mark them. And so these areas are probably the best place to monitor for rodent activity in order to have an early warning system. Okay, so I'm sure you can see how the solution to this scenario is really a collaboration between your pest service provider and store management. That partnership is critical. Okay, let's move to the next scenario. This one's going to be roof rats in a casino. I tried to generalize a casino so that uh, you're not sitting there trying to guess what it is. We're talking about the whole property here. Uh, many buildings, grounds with uh, landscaping, all are involved. So in this situation, roof rats are fairly new to this area, appearing throughout the city over the past five years. These pests have been causing problems at many locations as they have gotten established. At this property, they are found in many areas inside buildings, but usually on and off with weeks in between activity in, in most cases. Sightings and droppings spread throughout, but only a few what I would call established populations on the interior. However, outside, there also seems to be a lot of activity around uh, palm trees that are out there, various legumes like uh, mesquite and palo verde, and dense landscaping. Uh, they've got bushes that are very dense that around the buildings. Okay, so this is a great example of where we, we need to look both at the big picture and the micro environments at the same time. So we'll start with the big picture here. The evidence suggests that the root cause is outside the buildings, high rodent pressure, rats recently invading the area, and they have everything they need to thrive. For food, there's date palms, there's seed pods, maybe even large cockroaches like American cockroaches in the area, which is a favorite food of rats. Harbors near the building, palm trees with untrimmed fronds, heavy bushes like rosemary, uh, these animals can hide, they can nest in there, it gives them what they need. There's plenty of water too. Think of the irrigation systems around there, bubblers in the landscaping. All this puts tremendous pressure on the building. All that's needed is access to the building. So keep in mind that the rats are new to this market. Before this, with no rats, we've grown lax over the years in keeping solid barriers. Now they can get in everywhere. Okay, so well, we can talk about killing rats inside and we do need to get on that, but that's that's just kind of part of the job. We, there's nothing really special about taking care of those individual populations inside. The bigger emphasis must be on the difficult task, the difficult task of converting the property to a less friendly place for rats. Look, that can be expensive. If it's not done though, we've, we've inadvertently created a rotopolis, a haven and a vacation home for these little quadrupeds. There's some hard work that needs to be done to fix this, but uh, it, that's the main thing that needs to happen here, along with getting them out of the inside. But if you don't fix that outside problem, then on it goes. All right, so let me summarize how we move through this scenario. So first you back up and take a look at that big picture. Find the root cause. You'll probably need an expert to do this. Your pest service provider should be able to help with that. Second, seal that structure, eliminate their access to it, and then focus on these individual areas and eliminate the rodents out of the buildings. And then third, again, go back outside and look at that pressure on the outside. What long-term things can be done? How can we change our practices with landscaping? How can we move through these? Thank goodness that you have a partnership with a really good pest service provider who can help you work through this, because this is a, a daunting task in this situation. Okay, last case study, rodents in a large distribution warehouse. This issue has appeared over the last six months. It's been a slow growing concern. Now the issue has spread beyond the walls of the distribution center. We've sent mice to the end customer. That is not good. Okay, this place is huge. It's hard to even know where to start. The solution for this lies in organizing your approach. 
being methodical, isolating active active areas where the, the rodents are active and creating localized action plans. These situations can usually be divided into smaller rodent population centers rather than treating it as one big issue. So get the root cause figured out is also critical critical in this. Is it the same species of rodent inside as outside the facility? In other words, is it coming from the outside? Oftentimes that's not the case. You can have house mouse inside and you can have deer mice on the outside and uh, you should be able to get that figured out. Are the rodents being delivered on product? So are there trends inside that we can take advantage of? For example, do they tend to nest in specific areas? Are they living in the pallets or actually in the product, in the shelving, in the walls and floors? Oftentimes you can, you can have a consistent theme that allows you to really get after these things. Do they like specific lines of products? Is the activity related to product turnover rates? That of course will vary across the inventory. Is there a trend there that we can take advantage of? So the whole goal is to break this down into manageable sections, organize the approach, and methodically solve each situation. So to summarize, first, identify how they're getting into that building. You've got to know what the source is. Second, break it into functional areas. Third, look for trends, organize, and track success of each of these areas. Celebrate the successes, because you'll need to in order to keep the, the momentum going on this. Then fourth, once areas get squared away, set up early warning systems to catch this thing before it becomes a large problem. Oh, by the way, once you have an infestation in a large building like this, for some reason, there's an increased risk of occurrences in the future, and you should be aware of that. All right, so that's the case studies. So what we've done here is we've gone over, we've talked about biology and behavior. We spent a little time on some of the things you can do around and in your facilities, what your pest service provider can offer in this partnership, and we've looked at case studies. So what we'd like to do now is move to a question and answer period, and let's see if uh, you've got any questions for us that we can answer. Yeah, they've got a lot of good ones, Douglas. Um, some really good ones here. We'll start with a pretty topical one. This one is related to current circumstances and, and is a little bit of a doozy hard situation from Michael here. But uh, so he says one challenge we're facing and several municipalities are COVID-19 related orders that are requiring restaurants to keep their doors and windows open. He said they've spoken to health departments and been told they have to comply with those orders. Um, but they would still also be closed if pests are found. So there's a catch 22 there. Um, they talked about air curtains and more frequent visits by pest management providers, but said it seems like a really impossible situation. Any thoughts or ideas, especially related to rodents? It's hard for everything, but he's really interested in rodents on this one. Sure. And, and these type of things are difficult. I mean, it's a challenge. Yeah. Keep those doors open. Well, <clears throat> okay. So a lot of pests will go through an open door. Large flies will actively fly through there. So you're talking about air curtains and those type of things. That That is what you have to resort to if you can't go outside and reduce the pressure on the outside. Uh, the same thing with rodents, right? The first thing is to go outside and see, then maybe you really need to beef up the amount of protection you have outside. Really look for ways to get that pressure down. And then you can beef up equipment right inside the doors too. Mice especially will run inside and then run down the wall and multi-catch traps can often pick those pick those up. Uh, you might change to some different types of traps that uh, may be more effective like uh, open boxes with snap traps inside and these type of things. So it's, it's getting creative and beefing up the protection on the outside and then beefing up that introduction point of monitoring and, and uh, maintenance. All right, great, thank you. Um, so one here was, how do you differentiate between rodent urine or droppings and other UV visible background materials in a food service environment? A great question. So, so we like flashy things like, let's say, ultraviolet flashlights and going around looking for stuff. That's That hasn't been the best way to do things. Uh, there's a lot of things that's pointed out in that question that fluoresce. 
sometimes it's difficult to, to tell what you're looking at. In fact, a lot of cleaners that are used will fluoresce under a black light. So you can end up with seeing stuff everywhere and freaking out that you've got the rodent activity everywhere. Uh, but fact of the matter is if there's urine in the area, there's usually droppings in the area too. And so uh, often a regular flashlight looking for droppings is the best way to, to go after this stuff. And that's what we do when we go on places. Usually uh, if it really needs to be looked at, droppings is the thing we key in on because we can have so many false positives when we're using a UV light and looking for fluorescent uh, signatures. Great. So the next one, I think we've we've taken a lesson from the video that you showed us here, um, saying that you know if glue boards and snap traps can easily be avoided and rodents learn how to manage those, uh, what options are there for catching rodents inside of restaurants? Very good. And and so here's the deal. And this is where you really need some uh, an expert in there taking a look at stuff and making some good choices. So if they're left at their leisure to go and look at these things, they can learn how to avoid them. On the other hand, if you can identify pathways, runways, holes that they have to use in order to get to their food, and then you put you put traps and things so that they have no choice to step but to step on them, <clears throat> you can get around that that behavior of exploring things, and you can actually <clears throat> excuse me force them to step on things and get caught. <clears throat> so this. So you have to change tactics. You have to think differently about it and put things down that they're forced to do. So one other, one other comment about this. Using rodenticides on the inside of facilities is also another option. In general, we discourage this because if you kill a rodent on the inside, then you've got a dead animal in there and you have odor issues. However, there's some situation <clears throat> where the pressure is so strong that Rodenticide may be a good option. So even though you may have dead rodents in there, if you're seeing live rodents visible in daytime and guests are seeing them, uh, rodenticide on the inside, as long as it's carefully controlled, put out and retrieved, as long as everyone's aware that it's being done and agree to it, that can be a very good solution for ongoing rodent activity inside places. Great. So the focus, obviously, in a lot of this conversation that we've had and a lot of the presentations so far, Douglas, is around um, exclusion. I mean, it's a much easier problem if you prevent it in the first place. Sure. And there's a structural component to that. Uh, so this one question here is sort of in, in that type of planning. Um, Don Marie asks, what aspects of building design would you recommend avoiding if you're building a new structure or planning a new structure? And kind of the second part of that is, if there's older buildings, are there particular things that we ever recommend upgrading to make it less rodent friendly in the first place? Great question. So let's see, when you're first building, how about don't put it in a strip mall? <laughs> okay, that, that may not be fair, but uh, oftentimes older buildings, uh, they're, they're adjacent to other buildings or they have old pipes underneath the ground, which give open freeways, and those can be a real challenge to try to seal up. Okay, but a new building that you're putting in, it, you know, usually it comes down to those door sweeps. Usually it comes down to thresholds and making sure that there's no gaps on the bottom, and really good planning there can often save you many, many problems. <clears throat> Older buildings, you just, just have to go through, take a good hard look, have a professional go in there looking for rub marks and other evidence that would suggest there's areas that can actually be sealed up. And it's a case by case, inch by inch battle with those. Yeah. And, and so kind of as a related question, we talked about door sweeps there. What are the advantages and disadvantages of brush-based brush barriers versus solid-based barriers, like if you're using weather stripping? Sure. So, yeah, so the advantages and disadvantages of whether you use, let's say, like a rubber or neoprene kind of, of stopper that slides along the ground or a brush, those often that decision is made as to what the door is being used for what the surface is like that that door runs across. Oftentimes the solid types of sweeps are used interior on, uh, on let's say, cement or vinyl floors. Um, there's, there's a lot of options that are out there. And so if the ground underneath the door isn't even and it, it continues to rub things off, 
then the threshold needs to be looked at and maybe it's less about that sweep. If you put a brush sweep on, they work well, but you have to make sure they're shoved all the way to the edge of that door and there's not a little gap in there. Our rodents, when they come up to those doors, they can smell um, what's inside there. They can feel the change of temperature and that will cause them to actually chew on small holes and make them bigger. So if, if you're consistently getting chew through sweep type um, door sweeps, then switch to the rubber ones. But I'll also tell you, if you're consistently getting rodent invasions, it's time to go outside and see what you can do to reduce that pressure out there and see if you can get that down outside so you don't have to deal with it at the barrier, because that's the second layer of protection. All right. So let's go low tech to high tech. Okay. <laughs> so uh, one of the next questions here and, and one of the general questions I had thought about was kind of the trend around remote monitoring, but there's a specific question of, uh, asking about details on like our internet linked rodent monitoring devices, especially in less visible areas like wear room mezzanine or dock door areas. Do you have thoughts on the relative value of those and, and kind of that trend in general? Oh, I have lots of thoughts on that. <laughs> <laughs> so much so you could, you could easily do a couple of uh, different discussions about that. So it's, it's a huge deal right now. The whole industry is looking at remote monitoring. There's trade offs with this. Look at cost money to put these sensors around and to link them into a, the cloud and, and send information. You can have this information locally available or you can actually push it out so that uh, if there's any event that occurs in a, a piece of equipment, it signals the pest service provider to respond. So where are these best used? Well, it kind of depends upon the situation. I will tell you that remote monitoring in hidden areas hard to get to places. Some of these devices have years of battery life and it's just a very good way to get a, something into hidden areas where you can't get eyes into and not have to tear open stuff to look at it on a monthly basis. That's a really good use for it. Whether or not it's a local signal or um, it's sent out to the cloud, it kind of depends upon the situation. If you've got people coming there on, on a regular basis, then maybe local works just fine. On the other hand, if you've got, uh, if uh, if it's somewhere that's extremely sensitive and you need to make sure that there's a reaction right away, then that cloud-based one would be a good thing to look at. A lot of learning still needs to take place with remote monitoring, and we're all working through this. Uh, but there's some real exciting things to come with that as we go down the road. Great. Uh, one additional thing I thought it would be good to touch on, um, Douglas, is around kind of legislation and how to work around that. Um, it, just for some background context, so the California legislature specifically very recently passed a bill that would basically put a moratorium on rodenticides or some rodenticides at least until it's not permanent, but until state agencies can develop better safeguards to protect wildlife. Obviously, right now, this is just California. I don't know how many of our uh, guests today are from California, but similar things could happen elsewhere. Is there any sort of general recommendation of what this is going to mean for pest service or how, how to respond to that? Sure. Okay. So this is another huge question. Thank you, Hans. Um, but uh, yeah, what's going on in California? It has far reaching implications. It, it, uh, we've got people outside the US who are very closely following this to see what happens. So California has passed a legislation that bans second generation um, anticoagulant rodenticides. And okay, I'm going to give you names of these just so you, <laughs> just so I say them. But it's brodificum, bromodialone, um, diphenicum, and dif diphethylone. All these are the most common rodenticides that we use. Okay, but it's not all rodenticides. We have some others that are acute toxins and first generation anticoagulants that uh, are also still available. There's also in that California law a caveat for food processing warehouses right of way and these type of things that have been put in there too so it's a very specific thing if you're in california you've got to take a good hard look at that and and make sure that whoever's providing service is following those guidelines and making sure that you're staying within there and giving you the protection you need around those buildings but it's it's a very interesting thing i i you know, as part of the industry, looking at the tools we have available, I would I would say that that's not the smartest move to just ban second generations. I think there 
could have been better ways to try to protect um, sensitive non-target things rather than just an outright ban. But but uh, it is what it is, and so we move forward and try to make sure that we're okay with these things. Sure. I think we're down to our last couple here because I know we're also coming up on time, um, but I think these are a little less large in scale. Uh, one was about retail grocery stores. So apparently they've run into a situation where store teams are are good at alerting them and Ecolab when they spot a rat, um, usually roof rats. And then Ecolab's response has been to come out, set traps, assess the building, and then obviously wait. And they've had this happen where nothing happens. They get it all set up, they're ready, nothing happens for weeks, even with visits from Ecolab, and then they suddenly have lots of rat activity. Um, are the, do you have hypotheses for what's happening there or suggestions of what you would do in those situations? Sure. All right. So as we talked about rats, they have, they're really smart and they'll go around and, and some areas they won't go back into for weeks at a time. And so you can be lulled into a sense that you've, you've solved something. Uh, there's, there's real no easy way around this. When that shows up again, somebody's got to crawl that place and figure out where they're coming in from. If it's a, if it's a, a, up against another building, uh, that wall needs to be looked at. Ultimately, there's somewhere that they're coming through, whether it's pipe chases uh, behind coolers, other hard to reach areas. It may be up through the ceiling also. Of course, roof rats, they're, they're all over the place. It may actually be from the outside in uh, on, underneath eaves or other places that they're able to get into. So no easy solution for that other than You've got to crawl that whole place and once again, try to figure out what's going on. And if somebody's already done it two, three times, then maybe it's time to get another set of eyes in there. Not that, not that anyone's failing. It's just that a different perspective can often help uncover new things. So a different set of eyes, you know, from a pest service provider perspective, talking with staff often uh, at there at the grocery store or whatever the retail location is, talking with them, they often know right where these things are coming from and can help guide you to that. So utilizing all the eyes that are on site, maybe getting another set of eyes, looking at things differently, walking different directions, tearing apart stuff that you haven't torn apart in the past. It's a battle and you've got to think your way through this. Great. Well, and with the last one here as a, as a topical question, as I sit here in mid-October in my window in St. Paul looking at four inches of snow in my backyard. Uh, with recent national predictions of the pending winter weather, which seem to be coming true already up north here, uh, do you expect there to be more or less road pressure this winter as compared to recent years? Well, you know, I think the answer to that is always you expect more. Yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> and, for more and, and be surprised if it's not. That's right. And so at this time is when you see that swell of activity as rodents move out of, of where they are and start looking for safe places to go. And they follow warm air. They follow the smells that are in our places. So this is a time to really take a hard look at those barriers. One of these months is probably the best ones to do a pass through all facilities, checking all doors and making sure it's good and tight. This is also the time for the service provider to be very vigilant on evidence of activity on the exterior. If you see a bump in the amount of feeding in stations or other things that would indicate that there's more rodents, then we should be addressing it on the outside to try to get in front of this pressure wave to make sure that uh, inside we don't have issues this winter. Great, Douglas, thanks so much for all of this expertise. This is incredibly helpful. And we have some comments uh, that, that suggest the same. Um, just a couple of things I wanted to wrap up with. One, uh, my favorite question that, that doesn't go to Douglas so is, are there more of these types of trainings planned? Uh, which is what we like to hear. <laughs> so yeah, we the, periodically we're trying to produce information like this. And one of the big takeaways that we hope that you have from this webinar is that, you know, this is not, an industry that's managed just by doing pure grunt or part of what you really want from the partnership is you need the expertise like Douglas's. Um, this is this is a science based industry and should be approached as such. So this is one of the benefits that you have of getting that type of partnership. And so we hope to continue to make that available in all sorts of different ways and different formats. Uh, the last piece that came up is whether this is being recorded and shared and whether the presentation deck will be distributed to attendees. Uh, my understanding, understanding is that it will be recorded and shared. Um, Melissa, am I, am I missing any other details around that? 
Uh, yes, today's webinar is being recorded and it will be available on ecolab.com um, on our rodent page uh, early next week and all attendees um, in attendance today and even those who potentially have missed will receive um, an email with a link to this recording so they can share it um, with their their staff as they see fit. Terrific. Well, with that, um, we have reached our time, but thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you for the fantastic questions. And Douglas, thank you for the wisdom. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Yep.